God is saying to his people, stop living in the past. Stop looking back at what I've done and start looking ahead to what I want to do. So I am sitting right now in the sanctuary of South Louisville Christian Church. Now you have to hear what happened in this place in 1962. They decided that God was leading them to be a part of something new that he wanted to do in the Louisville area. And this church was called to plant a new church that would come to be known as Southeast Christian Church. So just think about that for a moment. Think about the impact that this church that you've probably never been to, maybe never even heard of, that it's had on your life or your marriage, your salvation, that the people who worshiped here in 1962 made a decision to be a part of something new that God wanted to do, and it had a big impact on your life and my life. And one weekend, they finally asked for a decision who was gonna leave to go be a part of this new church, and 53 people stood up on that weekend and said, I'll do it. I'll be a part of this new thing God wants to do. But think about the sacrifices those people made. They had to step out of their comfort zone. They had to be willing to give more generously than they had before. They were a part of this church, and they were gonna be meeting now in an elementary school, so things were gonna be different. And God wants to do something new, but whenever he does something new, it requires something different of us. We can't stay where we are and go with God at the same time. We can't just live in the past talking about what God once did and be a part of the new thing he wants to do. And so this is South Louisville Christian Church. What I want you to understand is that the spirit of South Louisville Christian Church, it lives in the spirit of Southeast Christian Church. One of the things you've heard me talk about repeatedly in this season is how much courage and faith come when we realize that God is the God who goes before us. And that video that you just watched is another, from my perspective, is another example of how true that is because I recorded that video in June of 2019, so June of last year. And I remember very well as they were setting up the video equipment to get ready for that shoot, I went for a little walk down the street and that church South Louisville sits between uh, Churchill Downs and the University of Louisville. I walked around and I just love the diversity and the different kinds of people that live in that area. And as I walked, I prayed. I, I, I prayed and I thanked God for the way South Louisville Christian Church has been so faithful to be a light in that community for so many years. What a rich heritage Southeast came from that that would be our mother church. And as I, I walked, I also was thinking about the message I was gonna preach in that video, where I was gonna talk about how God wants to do something new, something unexpected. And I prayed as well, God, would you do something new, unexpected through this church and in this community, this church that started Southeast 58 years ago, would you do something new? So they started Southeast in July of 1962. But this past July, just a couple of months ago, some of our elders sat down with the elders of South Louisville Christian Church and we began to talk and pray with them about the possibility of South Louisville Christian Church becoming a Southeast campus. We simply prayed for God's will to be clear. That's all any of us wanted. Whatever he wanted was what we wanted. And so this weekend, I am thrilled to be able to announce that South Louisville Christian Church will be merging with Southeast to become Southeast's newest campus. It will be our South Louisville campus. And I just believe only God could write a story like this. So just wanna ask you as a church family at all of our campuses and online uh, to celebrate, to give God thanks for what he's doing and to be praying as we prepare to launch the South Louisville campus, uh, be praying that we'll continue to build on the foundation that South Louisville Christian Church uh, is built on. Be praying that God would raise up the right campus pastor and right ministry team to lead that campus. So look, no matter what campus you attend, you are a part of this new campus. Uh, we are thrilled that they're gonna be a part of our family. I have, as you have, I have been praying and praying and praying and praying for our city during these challenging times. But as a church, we don't want to just pray from the outskirts. We don't wanna just sit in the suburbs. And I could not be more excited about the ministry opportunities that all of us will have through our new South Louisville campus. Um, as God would have it, 
this weekend, you're gonna hear from former senior pastor, Dave Stone. I remember getting a phone call from Dave when I was 26 years old. And I had some young kids running around being loud. So I went into the bathroom at our house and I shut the door and I sat on the edge of the bathtub and I talked to Dave about the future of Southeast. And he talked to me about his vision for Southeast to reach new people and new communities by starting new campuses. And together we started dreaming about what that might look like. But I think both Dave and, and I know I would certainly agree that God has done more than we could have ever asked or imagined. So I'm incredibly grateful for this man's vision, for his humility, for his integrity, so thankful for his friendship. Would you please welcome Pastor Dave Stone? Well, thank you all. Man, what, what an exciting uh, announcement. And only God could write a story like this. And South Louisville had a, a vision for this entire region 58 years ago. In 1962, South Louisville was the largest and it was the most dynamic Christian church in the entire city. And 53 pioneers with faith and resolve left the comforts and convenience of their church in order to start a new church in the Hikes Point area that was called Southeast Christian. And many of you uh, did the same thing. And you were a pioneer to help us launch uh, a new campus. And you went to uh, a different campus in order to help to start that one off. So it's been incredible to watch South Louisville, uh, a new campus at an old location that brings us all back together. And they gave birth to us, first in the Hikes Point Church, and then that church grew and, and spawned every one of our campuses. So whether South Louisville is technically our mother church or in some cases to you, she would be our grandmother church. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure which it is, but I do know this, she's family. And wherever you are worshiping, you wouldn't be here if she had not been a part of our lives. About a dozen years ago, I, I stood right here and I gave the church an assignment. And I invited people to write their life story in 100 words or less and to share it with the Southeast family. Uh, let, me, let me read to you what, what one woman wrote. She said, when I was a little girl, it, it hurt being mocked and ignored and misunderstood. I wanted a friend who would accept me completely. And at the age of six, I began drawing and writing about my best friend. His name is Jesus. And over the years, I realized he is the one true God. And Jesus became my Savior and my Lord. And at age 42, Christ is everything to me. He transforms my strong will into abundant joy, contentment, and purpose. Today, in John chapter 15, Jesus is going to tell us how we can have abundant joy, contentment, and purpose. And at the risk of sounding like a, a broken record, let me just remind you of what you have been hearing throughout this series, and that is we need to remain in Christ. We must remain in Jesus. And I've read that 100-word testimony to you because Jennifer is a good example of remaining. And at first glance, that might sound like a, a nebulous term or a confusing phrase to, to say, Jesus saying, remain in me. But we've been unpacking this for the past three weeks, and so hopefully you're beginning to embrace and to understand that phrase of remain in me. And we've learned that that word remain, it literally means to stay, it means to abide, it means to live in a permanent residence. And that's what's taking place. Jesus is the life-giving vine, and we are the branches. And Kyle has done a great job throughout this series of reminding us that the job of the branch is to stay connected. Uh, storms may come along and they will take sticks that are dead, but a vibrant branch that is alive and connected has more staying power. And in John 15, it's all about living an unexplainable life. It's about doing what we cannot do on our own and becoming who we could never be on our own. But in order for you to become God's best version of you, you have to remain intimately connected to Jesus 
who is our source. And when I stop depending on the true vine, when I take a detour from the divine, it always leads to dishonoring and disappointing God. Sometimes it's my selfishness. Sometimes it's my recklessness. But it always comes back to my pride. I don't need a vine. I'm capable all by myself. But Jesus speaks truth when he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's why he continues to tell us to remain in him. Now, in John chapter 15, the word remain actually appears 10 different times in the first 11 verses. You say, well, why? Well, because the disciples were an awful lot like us. And sometimes they were slow to catch on. And repetition is used by a teacher in order to drive home the point, to make certain that you get it. And the disciples are going to need that reminder to remain because things are going to get rather chaotic in a matter of just the next few hours and what they will experience. And so he wants them to stay connected to him. I want you to look in your Bible at John chapter 15 verses 9 through 13, because it reveals how our lives can overflow with him by remaining in Jesus. We pick up the passage, John 15, we'll start with verse 9. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And as Jesus is with the disciples in John chapter 15, he reminds them that following him will bring trouble at times. But he reassures them that connecting to him will produce a rooted life and a secure life regardless of the storms that you might encounter. You say, okay, Dave, so why do you want me to remain in Jesus? Well, these verses that we just looked at make it clear that there are three positive and significant attributes which will overflow in your life if you remain connected to him. And by faithfully remaining, you now become eligible for that overflow. Here's the first one. If you are remaining in Christ, then love should naturally and regularly flow out of you. So love is the first attribute that is promised to those who remain in Christ. Uh, Look back at, at verses 9 and 10. It says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. So Jesus is saying here in in, in verse 9, he's saying, hey, I'm not asking you to do anything that I'm not willing to do. He set the example for us. And notice that Jesus doesn't say that everyone you love is going to love you back. That's why love is so difficult. That's why in, in John chapter 13, Jesus says, love is what will make Christians distinctive from everyone else. This past week, I came across a verse. I'm I'm sure I've read it before, but for some reason, it just kind of jumped off the page at me. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Let love be your highest goal. Let love be your highest goal. In other words, be intentional about this. Make this a high priority in your life. Uh, Work harder at this than anything else. Let love be your highest goal. Look for opportunities and then follow through. And Jesus keeps emphasizing this this word remain. As Kyle has said throughout this series, it's about connection and then production. And we can't get those out of order. And when we connect to Jesus, we will follow him. And Jesus will flow through our lives because following leads to flowing. That's the pattern. That's the process that that it takes. His love for others flows through us. And sometimes we show our love through our tenderness. Other times we we show it through our truthfulness. A couple of years ago, I, I 
I had baptized someone uh, right here, and a few weeks later, in the mail, I, I got a letter from them, and I got a picture of that baptism. And I, I thought that was pretty cool, uh, but it was taken from a few rows above, up in the balcony, and when I looked at the picture, it, it had this strange reflection, and it just made me laugh, and I, I said to, to Beth, I said, come here, you got to look at this picture. I said, look at this. I said, from this angle that it has, there's some reflection, and it makes it look like I got a bald spot on the back of the top of my head. And Beth kind of turned, and she looked at me, and I noticed that she wasn't laughing with me. And she said, are, are you joking? And what ensued was a long conversation that was eye-opening and candid and rather painful for me to hear. Evidently, it, it turns out that it wasn't a fluke. It wasn't a one in a million uh, shot of a camera angle. Instead, it was something that everyone was aware of. And uh, I actually thought about, I told her, I said, I might during this sermon, I, I might just bend over and, and lean forward and let people see this, this spot on the back of my head. And she said, they already know. <laughs> she said, they've known for some time. So I'm like, oh, great. Then I said something to the tech crew, and I thought, you know what? I'll, maybe I'll do it uh, in the service, and they can bring the camera in. And they said, no, no, we don't, we don't want to risk that. I said, risk what? They said, we're afraid it might blind the people. <laughs> so they, they care more about your eyesight than they do the fragile ego of a balding preacher, right? <laughs> That's not love. <laughs> Even if it's true, they can at least be tender about it, right? Well, here in John chapter 15, we learn that if we remain attached to the vine, to Jesus, then his love will naturally flow through us. It becomes a normal and natural expression when you have experienced God's love. And the early Christians were known for love. And let me back that claim up for you. There was a second century historian by the name, by the name of Aristides. And Aristides was commissioned by the Roman emperor to give a report on the Christian community and to tell him exactly who the Christians were and to acquaint him with them. And here are the findings that Aristides wrote for the emperor in 137 AD. The Christians, they show love to their neighbors. They do not do to one another what they would not have done to themselves. They speak gently to those who oppress them, and in this way they make them their friends. It has become their passion to do good to their enemies. They live in the awareness of their smallness. And every one of them has, who has anything gives ungrudgingly to the one who has nothing. And if they see a traveling stranger, they bring him under their roof, and they rejoice over him as over a real brother, because they know that they are brothers in God. And if anyone among them is poor or comes into want, while they themselves have nothing to spare, they fast two or three days for him. In this way, they can supply any poor man with the food that he needs. This, O oh emperor, is the rule of life of the Christians. And this is their manner of life. They were known by their love. And think about that for a minute. These Christians did not even have the New Testament compiled for them yet. All they had to go on was that Jesus, the one who came back from the dead, had said, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. And there was nothing new about loving others. What made this new is the as I have loved you part. And when Jesus first said that to his disciples, he hadn't even laid his life down yet. Love is a sharp contrast from what we have been witnessing and experiencing and seeing during the months of, of 2020. And we all have our opinions and we are all convinced that in a pandemic, we could lead through it better than our, our, our boss could at work or better than our mayor could or better than our governor could or better than our president could. Our pride can be astounding at times. But one thing that we can agree on is that these past few months, we've seen increased 
isolation, leading to emotional anxiety, coupled with the time of rising racial tension, and then completing the perfect storm is this period of political polarization. 44 days until a presidential election. And the brutal truth and reality is this. A vaccine won't fix any of the things that I just listed. It will take something much stronger. And Jesus is saying it will take love. Undeserved, uncomfortable, unconditional, unlimited love. A love that is only possible when you remain in Christ. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, he says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. There's a temptation for, for love to grow cold. There's a temptation that when Satan intimidates and when evil escalates and the culture deteriorates, for our love to grow cold. For us to pull back, to, to begin to look at people who believe differently or who vote differently, to look at them differently. There's this temptation to be selective or to start holding back and saying, well, I'll serve this person, but I won't love this one. And I'll love this one, but I won't serve that one. And Jesus says, if you ever find yourself living in a season or a time like that, you will be tempted to hold back. But I'm telling you, dive in. And he says, you need to love people as I have loved you. And the very next day after he says that, while hanging on a cross, he will pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And rather than revenge, he prays for mercy. And instead of condemnation, he prays for restoration. What if in 2020, someone commissioned in your neighborhood to acquaint a leader with who Christians are? If they observed your life, would love be mentioned in the report? Look back at our text in, in, in verses 10 and 11. Jesus says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And that leads us to the, the second attribute. The first was love. The second one is joy. Think of it like this. If you are remaining in Christ, then joy should be evident in the good times and in the bad times. Shouldn't matter what's going on in your life. The joy should still be evident. The joy should still be something that, that people can tell. There's something different about you. Jesus promised peace back in John 14. In John 15, Jesus promises joy. And when we are obedient to the Lord and we are remaining in him, the natural response is joy, abundant joy, overflowing joy. So there is a progression in this. Let's put this scripture uh, back, back up again of, of John 15, verse 10. When you obey my commands, you remain in my love. So that is very important to Jesus for us to, to make certain that we are serious and sincere about remaining in him. If we are, then we'll want to obey him. We'll obey what he's commanded. We talked about this about six weeks ago when we learned that God's love language is obedience. Look at verse 11. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, that your, your joy will overflow. That's what flows out from you. There's a purpose behind this. I've challenged you and I'm expecting you to be obedient, Jesus says, to love others as I have loved you. And when you do that, the byproduct in your life becomes overflowing joy. Now, maybe this will help it make more sense. When, when my kids were very little and Beth and I would go out on a date night, before we would leave them with the babysitter, sometimes we would say, hey, we're gonna be gone for a little while, but while we're gone, I'm, I'm expecting you to clean your room. You clean, clean your room up. I, I know it's a mess. And then we would go out and come back a couple of hours later. And when we'd come back, as soon as we'd come through the door, our kids were just waiting for us to come back. They said, come on, come on. They grab our wrists and say, come on, come on with us. Come on. I said, whoa, whoa, where, where are we going? Come see our room. Come see our room. Come see our room. I'm like, no, no, there's no way. No way I'm going in that room. 
That thing was a pig pen when I left. I bet you there's still toys all over the place. No, no, please, just come with us, come with us. Well, I'm walking back there, but I'm not going to open my eyes. And they'd walk us in there, and they'd say, open your eyes, please look, please look. And I said, no, no, I can't, can't do it. No, no, just look, Dad. And I opened my eyes up. And, of course, the room would be immaculate, or else they never would have taken us back there, right? And I'd say, what in the world happened? Did you guys hire a cleaning crew? Did you bring somebody in to do this? No, no, Dad. You told us. You asked us. You told us to clean our room. And we did it. And we did it all by ourselves. And in that moment, they would see a smile creep across our faces. And somehow, that smile would be transferred over to their faces. You see, they just wanted to please their father. And at a very early age, in the process, they discovered that obedience has a double benefit. It brought me joy, and it brought them joy. And the same is true when you obey your heavenly Father. It leads to overflowing joy. It leads to contentment. And before we leave this, this section, let me just point out that, that uh, there's a qualifier that's here. When I speak of joy, I'm not talking about a giddiness, all right? There's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is based on happenings. It's, it's dictated by circumstances. But joy, joy is different. Joy comes from within. It comes from a deeper place. Joy is more than happiness. It goes beyond the excitement of the pay raise or the A on the test or the first date with that special someone. Joy runs deep. It lasts. It has staying power, even in the tough times. What was it that I read earlier that Jennifer wrote? Uh, abundant joy, contentment, and purpose. You see, joy brings fulfillment, but it's not always expressed by effervescence or enthusiasm. At times, joy is evident through a quiet peace or a firm faith that gets you through a health challenge or a difficult season at work or a relational strain or starting over. And when you are attached to the vine, that type of joy isn't just possible or probable. Jesus says it's promised. Jesus says that your joy may overflow. Some translations say that your joy may be complete. It's a word that means to finish something. It means to be full of something. And in a world that is so empty, Jesus is promising a joy that is not fleeting, but one that is full and complete, even in the midst of some of the most challenging and unsettling of circumstances. A joy that pours out from being connected to him. Well, the third attribute that, that flows out of the Christ follower, if they will remain in him, is sacrifice. If you are remaining in Christ, you will be willing to sacrifice anything for him. The first thing that flows is love. The second is joy. The third is sacrifice. We sacrifice in so many different ways. We sacrifice through our giving of gifts, through our sharing of possessions, through the investing of time with people. Sacrifice takes many different forms. Years ago, I, I combined an anniversary gift and a Christmas gift, and I, I gave Beth a, a cabinet uh, by combining those gifts. She was so excited about it, and my wife is very frugal, and the place had said, we'll deliver it for only $50, and that sounded great to me, but she said, oh, no. Uh -uh. We're not going to spend $50 on that. We'll borrow a truck and we'll go pick up the cabinet. So that's what we did. I borrowed my neighbor John's uh, truck and we picked up the cabinet. We brought it home. We got it inside. I'm walking back out to the truck and Beth said, hey, uh, are you sure you're going to be okay backing up that truck into the garage all by yourself? <laughs> I'm like, what, are you, what type of question is that to ask? I'm a man. This is an innate ability. It's in my blood. I said, no, I, th I think I've got this. She said, well, there are really big windows on the side. I said, no problem, babe. Well, I went out there, and I, I, I'll be honest with you. I had about two inches out of the entire thing that I had to play with on getting those mirrors inside there. I paid careful attention. I was so careful backing it up, and I, I want you to know I did not scratch the mirrors at all. 
Praise the Lord. But when I came in the garage, I kind of came in at an angle. And so I, I backed John's truck into his wife's car. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said, kind of. Uh, well, I tried to call John. They weren't at home. I tried to call John. He didn't answer the phone. My son said, Dad, they're up at a party with all of the neighbors. All of our neighbors are up there. So they told me which house it was. So I called up the Bennetts. I said, hey, can you put John on the phone and do me one favor? I said, just uh, before you hand him the phone, just say, love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> you know, it never hurts just to plant some seeds, right? And so she says that to John. John is laughing. He starts laughing. He says, hey, he said, what'd you do? Did you, did you wreck my truck? And I said, well, that's partially true. Uh, I said, actually, I, I wrecked your truck into your wife's new Lexus. And he was very nice about it, and, and his attorneys were great to work with. Um, <laughs> But the real pain surfaced when all of the neighbors who were at that party began leaving me voicemails over the course of the next few days. Uh, this is Billy's driving school. We have an opening for you. You know, this is AAA. We've revoked your membership. You know, every day it was a different message and, and it hurt. But I'll tell you what, there was one thing that bothered me a whole lot more than the expense of fixing two vehicles. And you know what it was? It was the fact that I wasn't invited to the neighborhood party. <laughs> That bothered me more than anything. But when you're invited into Jesus' life and you're invited to remain with him and in him, it becomes a life of sharing resources, of investing time into the lives of others. And in that sacrifice, you open yourself up and it will cost you something. It might cost you some time, some money. Sometimes it might cost you a friendship, but the cost is priceless compared to what is on the other side of it. In fact, Jesus is going to focus on an intentional sacrifice and not an accidental one. He's going to talk about the ultimate sacrifice. And little do the disciples know that Jesus' words will play out the very next day when he shows the extent of his love. Look at our last two verses, 12 and 13. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And Jesus leapfrogs over our everyday attempts at sacrifice. And in very certain terms, he states that the ultimate display of love is being willing to give up your life for someone else. A life marked by Jesus will always be a life shaped by sacrifice. And Jesus practices what he preaches. And the very next day, the shepherd will lay down his life for his sheep. But I don't want you to miss this. When he chose the cross and laid down his own life, it brought him incredible joy. You say, well, that, that sounds kind of masochistic. Well, what could bring him joy about the cross? What, what could bring him joy that he didn't already have in, in heaven before he came to earth? Well, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says it like this. It says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith who, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look at that. Who, for the joy set before him. What was the joy set before him? What was this joy that Jesus is, is talking about? What could motivate him down here on earth that didn't motivate him in heaven? What didn't he have down here that he didn't have up there? Up in heaven, he had authority. Up in heaven, he had people worshiping him. He had a throne. He had clout. He had authority. He had everything. What did earth have that heaven didn't have? What was the joy that was set before him? And the one thing that he didn't have in heaven was you. That's it. And so he came so that you could experience forgiveness and peace and joy and salvation. Tim Keller says it like this. If you became his joy, then he can become your joy. And that's the challenge that is right there before each and every one of us. I began this sermon by reading a testimony from one of our members. She's an author. Uh, she's a Bible college graduate. Uh, 
She's committed to remaining in Christ, and despite all of life's curveballs and difficult circumstances, she remains, and she remains in Christ. Now, I want you to listen to her testimony again, only this time, rather than me reading it to you, I want you to watch her saying it on a video that I shared with the church about a dozen years ago. Watch this with me. When I was a little girl, it hurt me and the and I I who set me complete as I about my my What defines who you are? If ever there was a person who could point to her circumstances or come up with some reasons to allow Satan to slowly steal her joy, it would be Jennifer Heck. But she is one of the most loving, joyful, and sacrificial people that I know. She allows Jesus to define her rather than her disability or rather than her circumstances. Jesus says, love one another in the way that I have loved you, and your joy will overflow. And I say to you, remain. Let's pray. Our Father, may we not be overcome by the things which seem to overwhelm us, but may our lives overflow with Jesus, just Jesus. And help us, Lord, to remain, to remember that the main thing is to keep remain the main thing. May we never forget that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.